to welcome you to our November program. And uh, <coughs> the program tonight is about ranked choice voting. Uh, the US Constitution doesn't say much about how to vote. <coughs> when, uh, and most of that is left up to uh, state and federal laws. Do we vote in secret? Do we vote in public? Do we vote on one day? Do we vote um, across time? All of, what kinds of machines do we use? All of these, and what, and how are the votes counted? And all of these different things are um, up to state and federal laws. Um, ranked choice voting, I think, is a new idea to many of us. The League has not taken an official position on whether it supports or opposes ranked choice voting, so we thought that this would be a good time for us to get information about that. And to that end, I've invited Ben Chapman, who is the Illinois director of the Fair Vote Project, which supports and um, supports ranked choice voting, so he can tell us all about it. So Ben, take it away. Hi, I'm Ben. Um, before I get started, I should say, I didn't realize this um, when I was setting this up, but there are a lot of stickers on my laptop. Those do not all represent the opinions of Fairvo. Um, we're a nonpartisan organization. They're just stickers that I put on there and I can't figure out how to get off. So um, they're going to be on there. Uh, this one is what I'm talking about today. So to get started, yeah. We're going to see, we're going to experiment a little bit. Okay. Right to turn some right. of those off or down so as to make the screen a little bit more. Ben, where are, where's your office? Where do you work? So I'm in Illinois, and I work sort of all across the state. Um, a lot of times it's just in my room on my laptop. That's the reality. But sometimes I travel up to Chicago just the other day. Um, the office for Fair Vote is in Washington, D.C., Tacoma Park. And it's about a dozen and a half uh, employees. It's a small nonprofit, but they do a lot of great research. And so they contracted me out of Illinois to see what would happen if we organized a bunch of folks in Illinois to work towards ranked choice voting. So, uh, ranked choice voting. Let's start with a few questions. Um, just because I, I presented to the League of Women Voters like a year, year and a half ago about, um, but I'd like to see where, uh, where people heard of this meeting and if they have any opinions. So who's from the League of Women Voters who's like a dues paying member? All right, okay. Okay, and who heard about this through like Facebook or something? Hey, nice. Okay. And who's here because they're my girlfriend and they're they're coming to support me? <laughs> so yeah, I do stack the crowd a little bit. Um, that just makes the presentations go a little smoother. Um, but all right, let's get some more questions. So who thinks things are going in Congress in the U.S. and at the state level really, really well right now? <laughs> okay. Who thinks things would be better? All right, now who thinks that the American people um, have just some core problem with them where um, they just vote wrong and they have bad hearts and they elect governments that are wrong for them? Okay, some people. <laughs> My sisters. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, now I got an actual question. This one's not like opinion based, this is to see if you can answer something for me that I always bring up because I don't know the answer to it and I've been looking for a while now. Um, the question is, why do we have two senators? Not how we ended up with two senators, not which founding father said, we shall have two senators for each state, but what justification was used or is still being used to say two senators is the optimal number of, two senator, or of senators for each state? Anyone have an answer? Equal number of representatives in each state. Equal number, so yeah, that's why for each state. Um, but why two? Why not three? Why not one? That's the, sort of the question I'm trying to get at here. Two parties. Two parties? No. That didn't really work, work out, though. One. They didn't think they would have just two parties. And Washington really hated right. two party system, so that would have kind of been abhorrent to them um, because the parties hadn't really. Uh, kind of work themselves out yet. Yeah. Maybe you need a backup in case something happens to one. Maybe, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, I mean, that's as good an answer as I've gotten so far. So the, the point of this question, the point of asking this question is we don't often think, we just, uh, we don't often think about is our government really shaped the way it should be? 
And I'd ask an even more interesting question, which is why do we have this, the number of House of Representatives we have? And that actually has a fascinating history. And it turns out we actually, if the Constitution had been ratified as it first uh, was, uh, okay, that's a long story and it's extremely <laughs> interesting. Talk to me after if you want to hear about it, it's fascinating. Um, but basically, our systems are not evidence-based. They're kind of stuck in the olden days. And we can do better. And one of those ways we can do better is ranked choice voting. So we have a problem. This is a very outdated ballot for 2020. There's a lot of candidates. And you only get to choose one. So who in this room would be satisfied with just choosing one and saying, I really like this one and hate all the rest? or dislike or don't want to give any support to any of the rest. Yeah, sorry, I shouldn't say hate. Who would prefer to give sort of a gradient of, you know, I like Castro, I'm okay with Tulsi Gabbard, um, I don't really like Harris, um, and I dislike Beto O'Rourke. Who would be more comfortable with giving that sort of voting uh, um, information? Okay, a few more people, yeah. And that's what, at its base, ranked choice voting is based on. It's saying people have complex opinions. They can't be boiled down to just one, one simple data point. We have more complex opinions than that. And so let's talk about how our, yeah. But don't you have a problem if in a general election, say one party has five possibilities you could vote for, Another party's got ten. So if you're in that party that's got ten, that's going to make it so nobody's exactly. going to do very well in comparison to the other party. Yes, and that is exactly the problem with this current system. And we see that play out. Thank you for 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 presenting to her putting us exactly on the next slide, because we see that problem play out where we have vote splitting happening all across um, different elections at different levels. Um, every single day. And so our current electoral system, we have a limited voter choice where you only get to give one data point. We have vote splitting and strategic voting. Vote splitting is when we have those 10 candidates and uh, the votes are divvied up between 10 versus you know another party having just a few candidates and the votes are split up less. So that's vote splitting. Then strategic voting is people going in there and saying, um, you know, I really like uh, Andrew Yang, but he doesn't really have a chance. So instead, I'm going to go in and vote for, you know, who really is probably my third or fourth choice, but Joe Biden, because Joe Biden has a chance of winning. So people aren't really voting with true preference. They're voting strategically to get the most out of their vote. Um, and then we have non-majority winners, where we have vote splitting, like you mentioned, and people are winning with less than 50% of the vote. And when people win with less than 50% of the vote, they don't have a strong mandate to govern. And... Uh, they aren't really representing the will of the populace. So I'm gonna give you more examples than you wanna see of, of these non-majority winners just because they really bother me, and so I'm gonna make them bother you also. Election of 1992, Clinton, Perot, and Bush. That was one of the first examples, well, that's one of the best recent examples of this, um, where Clinton came, came away the winner with 43% of the vote and Ross Perot took 19%. Ross Perot was a third party independent candidate who performed very well uh, by today's standards for an independent candidate. And we can think that, hey, Clinton did a good job, but if Ross Perot's voters had as a second choice preferred Bush, then that would have meant that most people actually preferred Bush over Clinton and Bush should have the victory. So that's an example in 1992. Then one that hurts a little bit more, because it's a little bit more recent to people, is Nader, Gore, and Bush. Where this isn't that much, 2.7% is not a lot of the electorate. But when it came down to it, in Gore versus Bush, um, places like Florida, where they were so, 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 so close, that 2.7% meant a lot. And Ralph Nader, who ran for office and said the things he believed and did his democratic right to be a candidate for the presidency was kind of vilified, not for any 
not for any political stance he took, not because people didn't like him personally, but just because he soaked up some of Gore's votes and people blamed him for that. That's not his fault, that's our electoral system's fault. I'm not trying to like defend Ralph Nader vehemently here, I'm just saying that's what happened. And there are implications for that. Now this is very recent, and it's probably one of the worst examples I've ever seen. Lori Lightfoot won in Chicago's mayor primary with 17.5% of the vote. Tony Preckwinkle had 16%. Those are not majorities. <laughs> now they have a runoff system in Chicago, so it's a little bit alleviated, the problem is. But 17.5% is not a significant amount of the electorate, so this is just to show that this problem is rampant. It happens at every level um, in elections all across the US. So, what is the solution? The solution is ranked choice voting. Show of hands, who's heard of this before? <coughs> oh, okay, so I'm, who, does everyone know exactly how ranked choice voting works? No, no, no. Oh, okay, perfect. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that explains why you're here, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> ranked choice voting, it's just a bit, you rank your candidates. People rank their favorite Star Wars movies, their favorite ice cream, ice cream flavors, um, Basketball teams, football teams, we like to rank stuff, and we're good at it, and it's intuitive. Um, so why not vote that way? Why do we care more about our favorite Star Wars movies than our candidates for president? Well, we shouldn't. I mean, some of us might, but it's okay. Um, how it works. Oh yes, this is important. What is ranked choice voting? Let's say we got four candidates. These are bar graphs of showing how much support they have. So this orange candidate is at 43%, this guy's at 37 or 8%, uh, we got 17 and about 10% over there. Nobody has a majority yet. Under our current system, we could call this election and say, hey, the orange candidate wins. But what if that candidate doesn't really have the, the uh, full support of a majority? Well, let's find out. What we're gonna do is we're gonna eliminate this lowest performing candidate. We're gonna say, okay, everybody who voted for that candidate you voted your true, true thoughts, but that candidate didn't perform well. So instead, let's give your vote to your second favorite choice. And so that candidate's votes are gonna pop up and they're gonna go to their second favorite choice. So it looks like this candidate went and kind of split um, a little bit uh, asymmetrically between the first and second candidate. We're inching closer to 50%, we're not quite there yet. So we gotta do another round. We keep doing rounds until a candidate gets over 50% of the votes. And after the uh, now last place candidate gets eliminated, this dark orange candidate uh, has a victory. Any questions on that process? All right, yeah. Well, where do you do that second and third choice? Well, we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna have a pretty good example of this when we have a mock RCB election here. Um, you all have balance, so I'll show you actually on the ground right here, um, how that process works. But the, the, uh, the ballot will, yeah, do you have a ballot? Nope. Oh, no, no, I got them up here, sorry. <laughs> here, that's what we're on back there. So voters mark down their first, second favorite, first, second, third, fourth favorite choices. Um, so the computers tabulate all this data and they take care of looking to see where the vote goes next. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, here. Is this exactly the same way it would work as if you had runoff elections at different times? Exactly, which is why ring choice voting is called instant runoff. It's basically <laughs> doing a bunch of runoff elections one after the other, but on the same ballot. So places like Chicago that use runoff elections, this is a way for them to save money and not have to do that, um, that extra primary. And what that does is, is it means more people are gonna turn out for that one election because they don't have to make two separate trips to the voting booth. They can just do one, you know, rank their candidates and do all those runoffs on one ballot. So if you know how a runoff system works, this is a way of doing a ton of runoff elections in one ballot. Yeah. 
So if we were doing this today with the Democratic presidential candidates, and I've lost track because I can't remember who all was dropped out, but we have something like 20 or 22, no. we would rank all the way from the first to the 22nd choice? The current limit we've got is 10. Um, limit who has? Uh, so <laughs> it's kind of of the, the voting machines. Okay. Um, and it depends on what voting machines you've got, and this is getting kind of into the wonkiness of franchise voting, but 10 is the limit for what we can reasonably do, and that honestly is kind of just what is, how much can we fit on a ballot? <laughs> and usually people aren't gonna be too disappointed if they can't rank their 11th favorite. Right. It's just, you know, most people don't think that hard. Um, but uh, usually ranked choice voting elections will give you three, four, or five choices down the line, um, and that's enough for people to feel, okay, I've expressed my opinions. Okay. Yeah, good question. Um, the ballots you have here give you five options, I think, just because I wanted people to fulfill their, uh, their wildest dreams with a runoff candidate. <laughs> so, um, any final questions about the, how the process works? If you're too embarrassed to say anything, right now we're gonna do a mock election here, yeah. Is a runoff election uh, the same thing as having several choices that you vote on? It's um, a runoff election, a standard runoff election, is when you have just two candidates win a primary, and then they go on and face each other. So you can have like 10 candidates, but then only two candidates will win that primary, and then basically what you're saying is you run off all eight other candidates. But that's not this current, this system. This system is a way of doing a bunch of little elections to run off one candidate at a time. So you can see how, uh, we, this candidate kind of isn't really that well liked, so we run them off, and then their votes will transfer to these guys, um, and then we're gonna run off that candidate, and this candidate comes away with the majority. So that's why it's called a runoff. Does that answer your question? Pretty much. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, we can talk more at the end. Uh, why is this good? It's kind of complicated to hear it first, but it's very simple, as you'll see when we do the mock election. But um, why is it good? One, more choices. We talked about that at the beginning. If you're giving just one data point, that's not enough. We want more choices. Two, it eliminates the spoiler effect. We don't have to worry about the Green Party splitting off votes. Um, we don't have to worry about strategically voting for our, uh, you know, our second or third favorite candidate because our actual favorite doesn't have a chance of winning. We get to express our true beliefs. And so um, if we don't get our favorite, we just get our second favorite or our third favorite. So it's eliminating the spoiler effect, so we don't get those weird results where candidates um, that, that don't get a lot of support have outsized impact on the election. Civil campaigns, that's a big one. Ranked choice voting completely changes the way candidates campaign, completely. In San Francisco, I was out there for the uh, election in 20, whatever, 2017, I think? Uh, so what, sorry? For mayor or for? For mayor or, yeah, yeah, mayor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of elections going on. Um, and uh, I found some literature, you know, as much as they care about the environment, they had literature all over the streets. So I was looking at it um, and I saw some of the literature had two different candidates on it. And I was like, these two people are running for the same office. What is going on here? And then I realized San Francisco has ranked choice voting. So the candidates were actually saying, rank one of us first and one of us second. We both basically believe the same things. So we're campaigning together because why not? We share the same values. So rank one of us first, one of us second. We don't really care. We just think that you should express your opinions and um, we share the same thing. So um, they were campaigning together. That's radically different from how we campaign uh, now, where in the presidential election, you might actually have noticed, if you're on Twitter as much as I am, that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren supporters, even though Sanders and Warren are sort of the two um, progressive, I don't want to put any labels on them because different people have different opinions, but that's sort of a conventional way of seeing them, is Sanders and Warren are the two progressive candidates out of the, the, the leading um, squad. They're going at each other's throats, and they shouldn't be. In a, in a reasonable electoral system, they should be sort of on the same side in this. They've got the same, uh, the similar platforms. But they actually have to go even harder against each other. 
because they're taking each other's support away. So if Warren can get rid of Sanders, that's a huge bonus for her because she's going to get a lot of those voters as second favorite choices. Uh, she's she she you know those voters will migrate over to her. Or if Sanders can get rid of Warren, those voters will come over to him. So right now we've got a backwards electoral system where candidates have to actually go more negative against those they agree with. Yes. Does this eliminate the electoral college? At the presidential level, it gets kind of strange. Um, in Illinois, we have legislation right now um, which would not eliminate the Electoral College, um, but we can do it within Illinois. So we can do ranked choice voting for, you know, to find out who won the state of Illinois, then Illinois sends its electoral votes to that person. Fair vote does work on getting rid of the Electoral College just because the Electoral College is like verifiably undemocratic, um, but this doesn't have any effect on that except where we get weird things where it collides with the Electoral College, which we can talk about, um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. What do county clerks think about this? Because in Maine, they recounted 300,000 ballots. And I yep. feel like Aaron would throw you off of <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Sorry. No, that's okay. So um, what do county clerks think of this? This adds an extra burden on election administrators. When it's done under the... Um, when it doesn't eliminate the primary, and right choice voting can get rid of the primary system if used to its fullest extent, then it does add an extra burden. And we want to be very clear that right choice voting will add a higher cost to our elections, um, but we want to take care of our election administrators. So it takes a little longer to tally up the, uh, the, the votes <laughs> because it's more complex. But uh, so it's going to take a higher budget and more staffing for uh, those the state board of elections and for for county clerk's offices. But so. still, um, if you eliminate them having to run a second primary, you may balance out the cost, or you'll save some money in the long run. Yes. So let's take Urbana for instance, where we happen to be. Urbana is home rule. And we are actually in prime territory for ranked choice voting at the municipal level. Because Urbana has a primary system, and that's not really justified for the amount of people running for office. And so if Urbana can uh, eliminate the primary and change to ranked choice voting, that's one less election for Aaron Hammonds to run, which can save him some, some time. But when we keep the primary system, as we probably would have to for a while at the presidential level, um, we kind of freak people out if we just got rid of the presidential primary. Uh, we 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 will have more high costs for elections, and yeah. Is that? We're not. I'm not I mean, going to just. I have fifteen thousand more questions. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, I mean, someday I might end up in uh, somebody's office to sit down with. Uh, yeah. So. Will you give me the bill number of the legislation that you're presenting? Yes. Even better, I'll send you the bill because it's not. Actually, um, I'll send you a draft of the bill, but it's not. Um, there's a placeholder in place right now. So, oh, it hasn't been. Um, it's been filed. It's just not the final. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> yeah, and then majority winners, which we talked about, you want to have that majority backing um, because that's how elections should work. So, how do we do this? Well, we have legislation. So the RCP Act is legislation that is introduced in the U.S. Congress right now. And this is a bill to establish the use of ranked voting in the elections for the offices of senator, representatives, uh, in con senator and representatives in Congress. So um, Dick Durbin, uh, Senator Durbin, Senator Duckworth, and uh, Congressman Davis, they would be elected via ranked choice voting. So we can think back to how, um, uh, whether there were big primaries for those elections. And obviously ranked choice voting doesn't come into place if we have only two candidates. So in the case of last year's Illinois 13th, race where we had was it five, technically five candidates, uh, that would have, this bill would have meant we used ranked choice voting for choosing between John Ebel, uh, Betsy Dirksen Lonjigan, um, Angel Sides, uh, Eric Jones, and David Gill. So this would have an impact on our district here in the Illinois 13. That's the RCB Act. And it was introduced by Representative Jamie Raskin and co-sponsored by uh, about a dozen other Representatives, yes. So this doesn't do away with political parties, though. The ranked choice voting is, well, you're smiling, so uh, go ahead. 
It doesn't. It doesn't have to. But what we find is that when ranked choice voting is used, we can sort of move away from the two-party system because people are no longer afraid to run as independents. Right now, there's a huge, 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 um, uh, let's see, huge disincentive from running as an independent because people think um, an independent, oh, they're not going to do well. So I prefer to vote for one of the main two parties who actually has a chance. So they're not looking at candidates on their merits or how they uh, agree with that candidate. They're looking at who has a chance of winning. And independents and third parties have for the longest time struggled with that, not because their platforms are things that people don't agree with, just because they haven't been able to break into um, you know, people seeing, seeing them as valid. So this doesn't have to get rid of the main two party system, but it can, and it can move us away from it, um, especially when combined with other reforms. Um, yeah, any other questions on, on yeah. So this is, a, this is a bill that's been introduced in the state? This is the uh, U.S. House. In the U.S. House, okay. Yeah. So then it gets all the way through and is passed. That would affect voting across every across state? Across the U.S., yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> it would likely face a few court challenges because um, <laughs> people would kind of freak out. And one of the questions that it often faces is, is this violating the one person, one vote? <coughs> and courts have found time and time again, it's not. Because one person gets one vote, it's just that vote transfers from their first to second to third choices. So that's one of the biggest questions. What happens when you apply something so kind of clean and fresh to billions of people? I mean, it's going to succumb to kind of the lowest common denominator of how people will treat it, right? I mean, voting is. We're fighting voter suppression. We're fighting, you know, the lack of people being well educated about voting. What about this should be taking priority over ending voter suppression and educating people about voting in general? It shouldn't be. It shouldn't take priority over anything. But all these reforms have to be seen as they're able to come together and fix democracy. So. Um, and we can look at how the benefits of each system uh, or each reform um, compare to each other. So ranked choice voting has the opportunity to make elections more civil. And with that, we can bring uh, new candidates into the field who are more diverse. Because um, I ran for office a while back, and I was kind of okay. I, I ran for a local office, so I wasn't expecting to see ads on TV saying, Ben Chapman hates puppies. Um, but if I ran for a higher office, I'd be kind of scared because I don't want to see myself maligned on TV, you know, day after day after day after day after day. And a lot of people agree with me on that, that they don't want to see their lives, you know, taken to the hands of, uh, or, or like bashed by some political action committee. And so when we have more civil campaigns, we bring more civil, uh, we bring more people to the table and more diverse people are elected. So that's one of the results we see. Um, is, is a higher diversity of, of different beliefs and uh, uh, racial diversity, gender diversity, those all come along with ranked voting. So can we do other things like better candidate recruitment? Is that something we can do? Absolutely. But this is part of that whole big uh, mosaic, mosaic of reforms. <laughs> yeah. This bill was in the US Congress, is that? focused only on um, federal elections and all states would then have to do their <coughs> thing? Yeah, so is this likely to be passed right now? Probably not. <laughs> um, and if it passes the House, is it likely to pass the Senate and get signed by President Trump? I'm just gonna take a guess and say no. <laughs> but down the road? If it did. <laughs> if, it, if it did, it would. Um, so this is, four years down the road, five years, six years, and that's being ambitious. Um, and then Fair Vote has extra things we want to add on. We have kind of a wish list bill, which is called the Fair Representation Act, which would add in uh, independent redistricting and, um, and add in uh, what's called multi-member districts, mm -hmm. where we actually have bigger districts with multiple people being elected for those districts. And that gets really ca kind of complicated, and I don't want to bother you because bother you with the specific specifics of that 
because people freak out when they hear about that. Like, you're trying to change democracy. But the evidence shows that it works. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's years down the road that that's eventually where we're heading. Uh, have any states started to consider this? Yes, Maine is using it at the state level. Um, Massachusetts is well on its way. They are extremely close. Connecticut's also on its way. And Illinois, we, are also, we also have legislation uh, just as of a few days ago in the Illinois legislature to bring ranked choice voting to the presidential elections. So, um, and that kind of brings me to the next topic, which is where ranked choice voting is being used in 2020, 2020. Um, Iowa, um, Wyoming, uh, Kansas, Alaska, and uh, Hawaii are all looking at different proposals for using ranked choice voting or ranked choice voting like electoral systems for electing the president. Maine is as well. Um, because they see that absolute crisis of 20 candidates on the ballot and people not having the choices that they want um, in, in the election. And so ranked choice voting has basically taken the world by storm because of the crisis we're in. I actually, every time I see some horrible electoral result happen, I kind of become happy because I'm like, oh yeah, there are going to be a lot of op-eds now in this area about this could have been solved, you know? Um, so after the Chicago mayoral election, the New York Times wrote an op-ed saying, hey Chicago, there's a way to fix your problem. Um, implement ranked choice voting and you won't have this problem with your electoral system. Um, and Chicago still hasn't changed. God knows why uh, they really need to. But um, New York is voting on it as we speak. Uh, so they, New York City, if they adopt ranked choice voting, that'll like triple or something, the number of people using ranked choice voting uh, in elections. Um, so I'll, I'll take some more questions, but I think we can start with the, do people understand how a ranked choice voting election works? OK, perfect. Um, so you can fill out your balance now, but before you do that, I'm going to split the room up so uh, because I have a sense I know which way this election is going to go if I don't do this. Um, let's split this, we put Jenna, um, this side of the room votes as if they are, um, okay, let's just do the person you like the least in the world. Vote as if you're them. So imagine the person that you like the least, vote as if you're them, so like rank the worst people, uh, you know, people you really don't like. The worst first. <laughs> sure, yeah. And then this side, you don't have to put your actual opinion. Um, I, you know, you're not obligated to tell me who you like as a candidate, obviously, but um, vote kind of how you would like to see things go. And then we'll pass those up and we'll have a weird little um, mock election. And feel free to ask questions uh, as we go. Anybody need a pen? Do you want us to write the winning for a six or just do these five? You're absolutely out. Like, feel free to. It's kind of fun because I like seeing who you put down. So this person. So you have to apply. Yeah. Do you like a... I don't know if it's a good pen, but... <laughs> Do you need a ballot? Do you need a ballot? I don't know where they end up. Trish may have some. I just said, no, I don't have any extra. Did we run out? The little girl behind me. It's her fault. <laughs> Let's do this. 
So Biden goes at the top, then, um, so Sanders goes in the middle there. Oh, and then you kind of lie them, mm -hmm. lie them down as if they're okay. in a row. Maybe turning, turning. So it'll actually go down the rows. So oh, okay. No, yeah. yeah. This is great. We had a lot of people. So it'll actually kind of look like an election. So we have one write in. Um, Usually it's like a football player or something, but this time it was a relatively realistic candidate. So um, Amy Klobuchar is our writing candidate. And then we've got, um, let's see, Pete Buttigieg is going to be uh, also one of the first to be eliminated. So Pete Buttigieg is eliminated along with Amy Klobuchar, and then the vote goes to the second choice, in this case Bernie Sanders. So the second choice there, and then we have uh, Klobuchar for Warren. All right, and now we have um, let's see, how many people are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 18. So it takes 9 to win, or 10 to win, 10 votes to win. Because once you have that majority, nobody can overcome you. So right now, Elizabeth Warren has 8 votes. Not enough. We need to eliminate another candidate. Which means that uh, Pete Buttigieg is going to go and then. Pete Buttigieg, the next vote here was to Warren, but Warren has uh, no votes, so we say but Warren is basically already eliminated. Oh, oh sorry, sorry, uh, Harris. Yeah, so the next vote goes to Harris. Um, then to Sanders is next, so Sanders is going to get one. Then uh, Buttigieg to Warren, so Warren is at nine, one more vote, and uh, she takes it, which means we have to see what happens with Biden here. So Biden, uh, we got one for Biden, goes to Sanders, Biden to Warren, and Warren wins, but let's just see how this goes down. Biden to Buttigieg, Buttigieg to Harris, Harris to Sanders, and then Biden to Buttigieg, Buttigieg to Warren. So Elizabeth Warren comes away with, with a victory. Um, that makes sense. Okay, um, so those of you who voted for who you truly believed in. Did you kind of see your vote? Um, well, I, I guess you can't really see which one's yours. But <laughs> did it make sense how the votes transfer along? You think, oh, if I can't get that one, then I want this one. If I can't get that one, then I want this one? Yes. OK, perfect. Um, yeah, I guess we can go back up. No, no, we stand it. Yeah. All right, now the part where I'm going to pass around two things and then we'll I'll, I'll do some questions. But the first one is sign in, sign up sheet. So if you want to get involved with Fairvote, um, stay up to date on what we're doing. Um, you already are. Yeah. So um, we'll start here. Here, right? Okay. Yeah. What are you saying? This is just to sign up for Fairvote. Um, if you'd like to stay up to date, you'll get emails from me saying, "Hey, we introduced this legislation. Hey, we need to contact this person today because they're a target legislator." Um, which Representative Ammons and Scott Bennett both are. Um, so this area is kind of a target area because y'all are constituents of Representative Ammons and Senator Bennett. Um, and then this last, this other one, um, which I'll pass around this way, is a, a quick way you can scan it with your phone if you just open up your camera. Um, or if you have like a, if you know how to do it, you know how to do it. But if you don't and you have an iPhone, let me know. Um, and that'll open up a quick way for you to contact your legislator, your state legislator, and tell them to support the Ranked Choice Voting for President Act, which is introduced in the Illinois General Assembly, and that will bring Ranked Choice Voting to the presidency in 2024 for Illinois. Today so far, um, last time I checked, it was our goal to get uh, 200 people to contact their legislators about that act uh, by the end of this week. So far, last time I checked, we were at like 110 by today. So that's why I'm in such a good mood is because today's going really well for ranked choice voting. And so um, my boss is going to be happy with me because he he's going to see those numbers and be like, Ben's doing something right. Um, so yeah, uh, we got those passed around. So what questions can I answer for you all? Yes. Can you tell us a few elections where ranked choice voting has been used? Absolutely. So my favorite example is obviously San Francisco. San Francisco, uh, it's a nonpartisan mayoral race. So 
San Francisco used to use the standard runoff, and um, they switched to a, a ranked choice voting system uh, just a few years back. So that mayoral race they saw where they had, and this is a drastic oversimplification, and if you know the race very well, this is going to come off reflecting poorly on me because it kind of oversimplifies some things that should not be oversimplified. But I'm going to do it for the sake of discussion. Um, just don't think badly of me, please, if you know this race very well. Um, there were three candidates. One was sort of the more moderate uh, candidate. Um, and then there were two other ones who were the progressives. And those two progressives worked together. They campaigned together. And the, uh, once one of them was eliminated, the vast majority of, that, uh, of the progressive candidate went to the other progressive candidate's vote tally. And it, uh, the, the result was much, much closer. It was within um, like a few percentage points of, uh, of uh, votes. Yeah, so I don't have a Sankey diagram up, but let me show this to you just because um, it's kind of neat. Do you, has, who's heard of a Sankey diagram? Nobody? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, the Sankey diagrams are a great way of showing uh, how the votes are distributed. So let's see if this comes up. Sankey? Probably some person who invented the type of diagram, I guess. I don't, I'm not sure. Charlie, do you know? Okay. All right, yeah, so this is what we're looking at. This image right here. Hey, this is actually working. Wow. Okay, so we had London Reed, who was the, for lack of more uh, appropriate terms, moderate candidate. And then uh, Mark Leno and Jane Kim, I believe. And Mark Leno and Jane Kim were the progressives, again, for lack of a better term. And you see they don't get eliminated until the very end, where Jane Kim um, gets, uh, uh, gets eliminated here. And some of her votes go up to London Breed, but just a very few of them. And then uh, most of her votes combine here with Mark Leno. So these two lines end up being the final tally. And that's 63,000 versus 71,000. So very close. But you can tell that um, if we stop right here and right here, it looks like London Breed is running away with the election by a solid 74, by a solid 20,000 votes. So that's if we use our current system. London Breed appears to have a, a big majority. But because they have ranked choice voting, Leno and Kim's support is kind of combined behind Leno, and Leno makes a very strong uh, uh, showing, which he deserves due to the people's opinions about him. So that's one example. Um, there are other examples in Maine where this faced one of its um, more exciting court cases. Um, I mean, it, was, it got struck down by a pretty vicious opinion. But the election looked a lot like this one. where I think the candidates were Jared Golden and Bruce Poliquin. Maine has strong independent parties and strong independent candidates. So there were actually two candidates that had, you know, two, three, four percent of the vote each. After the first round of votes, Bruce Poliquin, the Republican, won. He had about a one percentage uh, advantage over Jared Golden, the Democrat. But after the two independent candidates were eliminated, and both those independents were kind of on the left side of the political spectrum, after those two were eliminated, Jared Golden came away with about a 2% uh, victory. So that's an election where it would have gone completely differently if we had the current system, because those two independents would have split away votes. So right choice voting has immediate real impacts on who represents us. Um, and those are just two examples off the top of my head. There will be more and more and more and more examples of this as we have more elections like this. So does that answer your question? Okay, good. What are, what are the critics saying 
fair voting? So one of the criti criticisms is that it costs more money. And I, you know, I'm not gonna say it doesn't. We really have to take care of our election administrators because this is gonna be more work. And they're already overworked and underpaid, so we need to take care of them. That's step one. Two is that it's too complicated. That one doesn't really carry water to me um, because people know how to rank things. And they know how to say, well, if I can't have that one, then I'll have that one. They know how to go to a restaurant and say, well, they're out of spaghetti, so I'll have the soup. People know how to do that. Um, and who felt that this was too complex of a, of a voting system? No? Okay. So yeah, that's, that's one of the things. The other, the third one is that it just won't change anything and that it won't, I think I saw recently the Heritage Foundation, um, which for those who don't know is uh, sort of a right-leaning think tank. <laughs> Look, I'm trying to be. <laughs> the Heritage Foundation has come out against ranked choice voting. Why? God knows. I don't, they don't really have any evidence behind their opinion. They just decided they don't like it from what I can tell. And they basically say, it's not gonna, I think the video, the guy literally said, um, rate choice voting isn't gonna make camp campaigns more civil. People are, are not, these are very intense issues and, and there's no real way except to go to the hearts of the American people and change how they feel about each other. Um, but that's just not true. Um, we have example after example of ranked choice voting making campaigns more civil and it is astounding how much the way people feel about each other is affected by the way our leaders talk about um, other candidates and other people. It's astounding. And so when we change ranked choice to ranked choice voting, then we uh, get, you know, people are nicer to each other. And that is kind of important. Yeah. I guess one of my main concerns is that it appears that ranked choice voting would really increase um, the number of parties the number of independent parties because you could run without, as you say, the disadvantage of being a spoiler. And that introduces a huge amount of potential change into the system. And I don't know whether it's good or it's bad, but it certainly seems to be something that we need to be concerned about. It's what the founders thought was going to happen. It's founders thought there would be multiple parties. parties. And in many countries, of course, there are yes, multiple yes. Kind of parties. But the, I think you can't ignore the fact that that's a very possible outcome of yeah, ranked choice exactly. voting. That, to me, is a benefit, that we get more parties and that independents get a fair shot, because our democracy should be open to anyone. Um, whether or not you agree with the Libertarian Party or the Green Party, they have a constitutional right to be candidates, and they have a constitutional right to form a political party. They are already sort of pushed out of the discussion by uh, ballot access laws, mm -hmm. especially in Illinois. Mm -hmm. And I, I work with um, their, the Green Party um, and the Libertarian Party talk about this issue a lot because ranked choice voting is essential to them to be able to actually you know, not be degraded as you're a spoiler. Um, you know, they're not taking it seriously now. And they really hate the ballot access laws in Illinois, and rightly so. But once we add more parties into the mix, how is that going to change things? We can look to places like uh, France or um, uh, Ireland. Um, and though these, these places with more political parties, they don't have perfect democracies. But, um, well, I guess I'll go to an anecdote for this one. Um, I have a friend from uh, Ireland who um, I called up one day, he's on Fair Votes list, and it's my job to, um, you know, if people want to get involved, it's my job to work with them to find a way for them to get involved. Oh, thanks. And, um, and so I called him up and I said, so why are you interested in ranked choice voting? <laughs> and um, it was one of my favorite phone calls because he's Irish, so he has this great accent. And he was telling me all about how he came to America from Ireland and saw that the problems that we have here with our democracy are completely different than they have in Ireland. He just took for granted that, I should say, Ireland uses ranked choice voting, so that'll make more sense for this story. Um, but he saw a much better functioning democracy in Ireland where they have ranked choice voting than we have here. So 
more parties in the system I see as a good thing. Not calling candidates spoilers and not uh, being subject to spoiler elections like this, that's a good thing and it brings more voices to the table and it can kind of get us out of that two-party gridlock that if you're in Illinois, you may be somewhat familiar with. So, um, yeah. So you talked about how right, um, choice voting uh, makes for a kind of gentler campaigning. Um, what about campaign financing? Does it, uh, have they seen any changes in that? Because I could see a lot of money going into particular folks or groups of folks. Yeah, so ranked choice voting obviously doesn't directly change the uh, campaign finance um, uh, kind of ecosystem. It doesn't change, you know, it's not going to say you can't get donations from this person. But side effects of it do change how candidates think about fundraising. So to start with, campaigns become more issue-based because attacking candidates and just running negative ad after negative ad after negative ad, that's not as effective for campaigning because you're gonna uh, insult voters and you're going to offend them and not, they're not gonna put you down as your second, third, or fourth your choice. So that's one, is it moves us away from negative ads which kind of takes a little bit of money out of it. The other one, the second benefit, or the second, the second way it affects it, is when we get rid of the primary and this is when we convert to a ranked choice voting system for municipal elections. So we skip the primary, basically, and we shorten the campaign cycle, which means, <laughs> <laughs> apparently that's a popular idea. And we shorten the campaign cycle and people have to spend less time out there running those ads. They have to spend less time knocking on doors. They have to pay staffers less. Um, well, they pay staffers the same way, just for a shorter amount of time as a, campaign staffer, you know, you should still pay us. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so it, it means that your ability to fundraise a ton of money over a long period of time is less of a factor in deciding your success as a candidate. And that also plays into how we elect more diverse people because you don't have to be a millionaire to run for an office necessarily. You can, you can be a, a semi-well-connected person instead of like the most well-connected person in the entire state. Any more questions? Yes. Why, why did, in Illinois did they start with the presidential election? So, starting in Illinois with the presidential election is part political strategy um, and partly because we really need it at the presidential level. So, there's momentum for it right now at the presidential level because people see this impending crisis where the two parties are not gonna be able to choose the right candidate mm -hmm. or the, the strongest candidate to go against um, the other, well in the case of the Democratic Party, they risk, under our current system, not putting the best candidate up against Donald Trump. And the Democratic Party really wants to put a good candidate up against Donald Trump. So the Democratic Party sees sort of, they have an interest in ranked choice voting right now. Um, for the presidential level at least. The other reason is we don't have to deal with the Illinois Constitution as much. Because if we change how governors are elected and how state representatives are elected, there's slightly different rules about that in Illinois um, than how the president is elected. So this is a way for us to introduce legislation that puts us at the least likely um, uh, position for having to deal with a lawsuit. Um, about so there'd be a lot of legal challenges every yes, other vote. Yeah. I don't say lawsuit as in like we committed a crime. I say lawsuit <laughs> as in people are gonna challenge this in the courts and see whether it's constitutional. Yeah. So I, I can see that, certainly see the benefits of this, and I see it particularly for the presidential election. I can understand politically why that was a move in Illinois. One of the things you spoke about earlier is how this eliminates or helps eliminate strategic voting, mm -hmm. and I think that's largely true, but I would still expect, particularly in the Democratic presidential primary, there's going to be a lot of strategic voting because I believe a lot of Democratic voters, who, you know, from my, in my opinion, my opinion only, there's a fair number of good candidates on the Democratic ticket mm -hmm. right now. They're, I'm impressed with the field. There may be some I like better than others, but I think many of us are focused on who can go up against. 
the current president and win. So I, I, I guess, I don't know if this is a question or I'm asking if you see this differently. I still would expect, even with ranked choice voting, there will be a lot of strategic rankings um, rather than perhaps who we would most want in a perfect world to be president. Yeah, those are those are very. Um, that, that's that's a very good um, point because if we eliminate the primary and we were just doing this, putting all the candidates in the general election, then people wouldn't have to strategically strategically vote at all because you'd be saying, I want Warren, but if Warren loses, um, then I'll take Buttigieg. <coughs> if Buttigieg loses, and your vote would never go to Donald Trump. So if we eliminate the primary, then that totally gets rid of the opportunity for strategic voting. But under the primary system, you're exactly right. We still do have just a little bit of who is the best candidate to go against. Especially when you, whatever party you were in, especially when you, know, if there's an incumbent who's up for re-election, you know who that candidate is going to be with 99 point yeah. something percent certainty. Yeah. Um, so I think that's where, right. with a with a primary system, you still have to be. Or many people will still choose to be strategic. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Um, that, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Am I low on time? No. I'm, um, yeah. Unless people have more questions, do we still have more questions? Didn't we have ranked choice voting in Illinois in the past? It's possible that. we had a version of that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, we had well, a why did they get rid of it? We had multi-member districts in the past, but um, we had. We used to have a, a ranking. Maybe you're older than I. I am. <laughs> <laughs> a very long time ago. This we, is actually a very old idea that's yeah. kind of having a... We, we had that for certain elections in the past. Yeah. And you yeah. put one, two, three. I wouldn't have local. But I don't, I, it certainly wasn't presidential. It certainly wasn't senatorial for the Washington. But I think we had it here. I think it was when Helen Satterthwaite was... A representative. I mean, there were the multi-member district. Multi, multi-member. That's diff different than. Yeah, that was different, and that was that was uh, changed on the basis of <coughs> lessening the cost of paying the legislators and supporting the legislators. And we now they're talking about expanding it again. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Well, um, I'd really like to thank you for coming out. Thank Ben for explaining. Thank you very much. this meeting and the video will be up on the League of Women Voters of Champaign County website and it will be in on your YouTube. Yes, on YouTube too. So if you have friends that are still in, that are interested in the topic, you can direct them there and find this whole interesting discussion. So thank you very much for coming tonight.